Hi, I'm Genevieve Douglas with Bloomberg Law, and I'm here at the Littler Executive Employer Conference. And joining me are two Littler attorneys. We have Helene Wasserman, who's a shareholder, and we have Kevin O'Neill, who's the senior director of the Littler Training Group. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah. So I want to dive right in, because why not, uh, since this is such an important topic to workers and employers alike. Uh, Helene, what does the post-Weinstein sexual harassment landscape look like right now? Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I was fortunate enough to hear Toronto Burke speak. And obviously we all know Toronto Burke started the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And she made this comment, something along the lines of, it feels like we live in a real-life whack-a-mole game right now. Right. I mean, near a day goes by where you don't listen to the news and see some high-profile individual, regardless of whether they're in the media or in entertainment or in tech, who is now being accused. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that, you know, this is really not new. I mean, anybody who knows the world knows that sexual harassment claims are really not new. Right. What's new is this platform, the Me Too platform. And what that mm -hmm. is, is it's giving individuals the, they're making them feel more empowered mm -hmm. and more emboldened to come forward. People who never felt that they even had a voice are now coming forward in the, in the world as well as in the workplace. Right. And that's what we're dealing with now on a regular basis is how to address those claims that are being made by individuals who previously weren't making claims. Right. And I know training has to be a big piece of the puzzle. How is that evolving as this becomes a topic much more openly and discussed? Evolving is a good word because that is what it's doing. And it's really on those two tiers. One is the tier of since those voices are emboldened and they're coming out deeper and from different places. Right. You have to train the folks who are really kind of the point people for that message to know what to do and how to sift it out and to be aware of it and really how to be aware of warning signs much earlier. And then do certain, we've gotten kind of some tips, some prevention tips, shall we say, uh -huh. from the EEOC task report that came out okay. about two years ago now on harassment prevention. And it, it spends a good amount of its time focuses on, focusing on some new training efforts, oh, okay. including something they call bystander training. Right. And yeah, you've probably heard of this, and, and we've, we've talked about this Absolutely. quite a bit. And in a sense, we've been doing this quite a bit in our training already, but it, it really has kind of codified that as an imperative to teach the people who are out on the front lines. And it might be a different message for employees how to, how to set a tone, Certainly. how to set a boundary, and mm -hmm. how to be responsive. Uh, as opposed to managers who have to do all that, but also recognize when something is reportable, when something has to be dealt with much more significantly or severely. Sure. So it's kind of pushed the message out more towards the top of the mind than it was being put out for a lot of training approaches anyway in the past. And the other side of it is it's focused very heavily on the tone at the top. We're okay. probably hearing that reference a lot here today. But the tone at the top is also derived from uh, the EEOC task report as an imperative, really as a theme throughout, and as a training message. I'm doing, and I think you are also doing, a lot more executive-based C-suite level training. And it's a different message, in a sense, because it's not only trying to get them into that same bystander intervention mindset, what do I do when I see it, what do I do when I hear it, what do I do when I, when I suspect it, but also from a strategic planning perspective, what can we do collectively on the, in the C-suite, in the executive suite, so to speak, to strategize, uh, to prevent this, to respond to the social media outpouring? Right. What do we do when we wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning and last night there's been a social media posting outing our group? Uh, what can we do as a team collectively to be more responsive to that? I mean, it's interesting because a lot of employers don't know what to do with this whole social media thing because they think that social media, it's just that. It's somebody's Facebook page. It's, it's somebody's on somebody's Facebook page. And what we've been advising our clients to do is basically to tell them that, you know what, regardless of how you find the information out, if you become aware of the fact that there's a problem in your environment, you need to take action about it. And, and action can take multiple different forms. Okay. I mean, not every action is the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, an anonymous complaint is responded to differently than something that is not anonymous. Sure. But at the same time, in dealing with social media, because we live in a world of, of I, I remember there was something about how many millions of hashtag Me Too's suddenly oh. appeared on Facebook right. very shortly after the Me Too movement started. Mm -hmm. And employers don't quite know what to do with it. Because the fact of the matter is, if they're on notice that there is something going on in their workplace, mm -hmm. they have to take action. Right. Because what happens if that alleged harasser does it to someone else? Or if and they have people that are out there that are harassing people. 
So investigation, and I know that that's another big topic, is how to conduct these investigations. But even the, the most innocuous Me Too hashtag uh, post on social media needs to stir some type of an investigation. Right, because it's amplified it's kind of, now. Exactly. And it's louder. And it's, it's, yeah, and you know, it's broadened in scope in a sense so that even from a training perspective when we talk about these issues, really from that prevention lens standpoint, you have to think about, okay, even up front before you've hit the radar screen, screen of potential harassment, are you messaging out the right approach to what's being called civility mm -hmm. training and dealing with incivility? And on the other side of it, and I know you live in this space a little bit too, is then once you hit the investigation trigger, are you effectively responding to that, applying the right resources right. to that, and knowing how far and how wide to go? Investigations are now part of our messaging right. more than they even were before. Absolutely. And going back to the civility training for a minute, you know, what was the book, Everything I Ever Needed to Learn, I Learned in Kindergarten? Right. I mean, whoever, thought, to others. <laughs> whoever, whoever thought that we would live in a society mm -hmm. where you actually have to do training within your workplace environment right. on how to be civil to each other. Yeah. I mean, you would think that people would have learned that somewhere in their upbringing or somewhere in life. In kindergarten, perhaps. In, in kindergarten, even before kindergarten, you would have think people learn that. But the fact that we actually have to implement sub, uh, civility training is, is really, it's staggering to me, sort of looking at our society. Mm. And as far, you know, investigations are an interesting thing. And I know that that's, it's such a hot topic mm -hmm. and how investigations are conducted and by whom. Mm -hmm. I'm getting more and more questions about who should conduct investigations? Right. And should it be somebody, um, if we have a senior level individual, should we have someone in human resources conducting the investigation? And my, my general advice to that is, is no, um, especially considering the person who's doing the investigation might be investigating someone who is responsible for their livelihood, right. for their paycheck. And you want to make sure that there's no concern or belief at all about the issue of, uh, imp that you want to make sure that there is impartiality, that there isn't anything along those lines. But the task force report itself really called into question all of the training that we've been doing for, and all of the policies and procedures that we've been doing for decades. Yeah. I mean, sexual harassment training has been a legal requirement in California for decades at this point. Yeah, well, since 2005, at least. Why? It seems like it's been longer than that that we've been doing <laughs> training. Since the affirmative and defense in the oh, 90s, clearly. California has jumped into that and filled the void and said, right. we, we've got to be on this. It was all but mandatory, and then it was codified as mandatory about 15 or so years ago, how, whenever 2005 was. Right. I'm and not good at math anymore. And that's, isn't that what one of, the, one of the one of people spoke about earlier that we're lawyers because we don't do math? Um, well, and on that note, <laughs> no, I thank you all so much for joining me, and I, we have such a lively discussion. And I know we could keep going on and on and on, but I am so excited to discuss this further. And uh, take care. Thank Happy you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Thank you.